Welcome to the Cinema Spotlight, hosted by James Sun. All things entertainment. Grab your popcorn and enjoy the show. Hey everybody and welcome to the Cinema Spotlight. This is the show where we dissect all things movies, TV, and everything in between. I'm your host and self-proclaimed media expert, James Senna. I hope you're ready because during today's show, we're going to be kicking things off with, once again, the Oscar watch, followed by a segment of character selection. And stick around until the very end of the show because I'm going to be doing a deep dive on shows like Survivor and Big Brother and talk about why they are reality TV royalty. As always, before we get started, here's an official spoiler warning for any and all content that we discuss here today. And with that being said, let's shine a spotlight on the menu. Oscar Watch. Oscar Watch. So the menu was one of those movies where I was seeing another movie. It may have been Nope. It may have been The Banshees of Inisherin. It may have been one of those movies. But I saw the preview for it, and I was like, whoa, this is interesting. I think I saw the trailer on TV as well, and I was like, this is interesting. I like, I mean, I, the cast looked great, which got me really excited for it. But other than that, this is another movie that I kind of went in blind. I, not really, because the trailer sort of gives a chunk of the movie away. Actually, it give, weirdly, if you've seen the trailer, it gives off maybe more than it should. Basically, the premise that the trailer gives us for the menu is that a bunch of people are here to have dinner and they're going to, there's going to be mayhem, they're going to be in trouble and they might die. That is the general idea. Now, why am I talking about all this? Well, I think that the trailer sets you up to think that it's going to be about one thing and then it sort of isn't really about that and it actually is more of a deeper artistic production than you might think at first. Now, how would this fare? Obviously, we're covering it at the Oscar watch. How would this fare at the Oscars? Well, before we can talk about any of that, I think we got to figure out what the movie's about. <laughs> you know what I mean? You know what I mean? So, okay, let's just let's go into some light spoiler territory. You already got the warning in the intro. Let's talk about the movie. Okay, so it wasn't totally blind when I went in and I wasn't completely sure what the movie was going for, but I feel like we've seen movies where it's like, oh, there's a dinner party that goes wrong and there's something crazy that happens at the dinner party. There are, I mean, there's too many to name and a lot of them are not super famous movies for a good reason. So I'm not going to go into all that, but, you know, I didn't have super high expectations. I saw that it was a fun cast and that was all. And, I, you know, the premise felt fun. So I watched it, but here's what we know. Here's what we figure out. We meet a presumed couple as they're going for a fancy evening of uh, what I can only imagine would be food tasting. And that's sort of the general vibe that I get, is they're there to taste the food. We meet one couple first, uh, but we're gradually introduced to a couple other groups of people throughout this like intro segment. We're meeting certain individuals, a lot of whom are sort of a lot less relevant to the overall story um, than just the primary like people. Um, but we're, we, we, you know, we meet all of them. And... What we do know is that there's definitely some tension there for some reason. There's an older couple that definitely knows um, the main character, uh, who is played by Anya Taylor-Joy. And we will talk about all the actors and their performances uh, in just a little bit. But Anya Taylor-Joy is basically the main character of this story. And it is, it's not made essentially like super clear at the very beginning. Oh, actually, no, I, sorry, I take that back. It is made very clear <laughs> that that is the most important character. However, where that character kind of takes a backseat through some portions of the movie, which I actually think is an interesting choice. That being said, anyways, now we also know throughout this intro section, the chef is built up to be this huge character. Okay. And I mean, let's just, you know, he was, <laughs> he absolutely was the, probably the most important character in the entire movie that is even superseding, uh, Margo, who is the, the main character. Many of the supporting characters are intentionally unlikable. They did this on purpose throughout the intro, making a lot of the characters feel like, you know, uh, 
for lack of a better term, they just Karens at the restaurant, people who are complaining or people who are very annoying customers. Every single archetype that you can think of was built into one of these side characters. And honestly, to a point where I would say they're caricatures of those types of uh, real life people. So I think that that's definitely done intentionally. And well, more on that in a second. We were told early enough in the film that everyone will die. And I think this was done cleverly, clever, yeah, cleverly. I, I was saying it right. Uh, as to set an expectation. And I think this, this expectation was, was certainly met to a degree. And the movie knew when to be funny and when to make take itself very seriously. And I, I feel like it walked that line quite well. And that's essentially the the plot in a nutshell. That is that is the plot. The, a bunch of people show up to a, a food tasting and things go wrong very quickly. Now, what exactly... Like, I mean, what would I rate this movie? Okay, I'll just say it's a 7.2. Now, that's a bit high, actually, considering the premise is kind of bland and a, a little underwhelming just the the you know the idea of the movie itself is a little underwhelming however i think that director mark Millad, his directing and i'm i'm gonna go ahead and just credit adam mckay here uh as a producer and i'm gonna credit whoever the, the writers are on this movie they made such a simple premise into something that was actually very enjoyable and very artistic and this movie was a very artistic production but Let's just talk about the Oscars right off the bat here. I'm going to go out on a limb right off the bat and just say this movie will likely not win an Oscar. Um, do I think it's a bad movie? Not at all. 7.2, very respectable rating. However, um, I I just think in all the categories, because I did, you know, for, for the Oscar watch, a little behind the scenes here, I go through every single category and in my head, I think, do I think that this movie could win there? And for every single category... I think the ones that this would even get nominated for, it would probably be up against the likes of Nope, or The Banshees of Inisherin, or Everything Everywhere All at Once, and I'm sure a, like, you know, a plethora of other movies, you know, Tar being another one um, that might prevent someone like Annie Taylor-Joy winning an Oscar. The Chef, uh, played by Ralph Fiennes, Ralph Fiennes, I'm sure, um, he was excellent, but when I look at how they're listed, the actors, he's listed as a lead actor. And unfortunately, when you're going up against Colin Farrell, <laughs> it, it's going to be a hard, hard category to win based on the performance. Even though it was great, it, it just, it's not going to stack up to Banshees of Inner Sharon. I've already talked on the previous episode, if you want to go check that out, how much I love that movie. I've been doing a little bit more research after the fact because I didn't want to spoil my thoughts, but it, it feels like my vibes were right that that movie could certainly win a lot of Oscars. This one probably won't because I think it falls behind in some categories, but I'm going to give the, the movie some credit. There is one particular aspect that I think this movie could at least get a nomination in, and I, I don't want to... Actually, well, there's two. One is, I believe it's called just Best Artistic... An original production or something along those lines something that i was potentially giving to nope as well just because i think even though it's not necessarily the most original concept i think how this movie goes about achieving that concept was very artistic and very um intentional with everything that it does and it's almost like you're watching a sherlock it, 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 how do i say this it's like you're watching a Sherlock Holmes story play out without the mystery. Like, you know that there's some sort of a mystery, but the mystery is not really... the Like, you know what the ending is, but it's just how you lead up to that ending is how this movie does it. And I think that's very fascinating. And when I was watching it, I was blown away, actually, by the ability to be able to pull something like that off. Now, do I think Mark Millad is going to get an Oscar for this? Unfortunately, no. Um, I don't know if he'll get the nomination, although I think he deserves the utmost credit because I think what you're able to do with such a vague premise of just it's a dinner party that goes wrong what he was able to do with it astounded me but there is one aspect that I want to really hone in on here for this movie and that's film editing now if you've seen the movie you know this the editor is almost a character within the movie there are a lot of like cut scenes where it introduces like the next meal of the menu and a lot of them 
are very, it's, they're actually, you know, they start off serious and then they turn sarcastic, almost like whoever is making the menu is its own character or like the editor is its own character because these cutscenes are commenting on what is going on in the movie, which I think is very hilarious. And I, I genuinely laughed. You don't see that in movies enough where almost the people in post-production are commenting on what the movie is. And I love that detail. So do I think that the movie could win it? I don't know. I actually am still on the hunt to see everything everywhere all at once. I might have to buy it on Amazon to make sure that that happens. I've heard that the editing in that movie is crazy. So like crazy good. So I'm going to check that out hopefully for a future episode. But as far as the menu goes, I think it is definitely deserving of a nomination. If it doesn't get the nomination, I'll be kind of sad because I do think it deserves it. But and especially because it's stacked, but you have the text cards that have their own witty personality. But I also want to note the use of character claps as a way to transition the scene. I'm not going to clap for the, the microphone. And granted, this could also fall potentially under sound sound editing, but that's that's a different category. So I don't know where that would place if they were in the same category and they were labeled as such. I, I feel like uh, this movie would have a better chance, but but I digress. I, I do think that that choice to edit the film that way with the claps, you know, he, he claps at the beginning and it startles people, but it's, you know, you know, he's serving food, but the more intense the movie and the plot gets, each clap heightens and heightens and heightens. And by the end of the movie, when there's a clap, you're, you're scared as hell. Like it, it is actually very ominous. Now, is this movie scary? Because I, I think it's a thriller. I think it's like, labeled as a thriller it's not i didn't find it scary if you're like 10 and certain things make you wince or you know if they the sight of blood uh makes you uncomfortable or something like that yeah i mean there's definitely that aspect and there are some grotesque aspects to this movie but there's nothing crazy um i mentioned adam mckay as a producer and i just want to throw this in there this movie felt like don't look up it had a very similar vibe, and Adam McKay is responsible for both movies. He directed Don't Look Up. This movie, he was only a pro well, I say only, but he was a producer on this movie. And I could get that sense, because both movies do this thing where it's just this ominous... And this is what I want to talk about, basically, for most of the time that I have left here with this movie, because I think that this is definitely what the movie excels in the most, is very early... So, like, there's no character deaths until basically the end of the movie, they're talking about, oh, everyone's going to die. Everyone's going to die. Okay. But like, why would you say that? So at the beginning of the movie, they said everyone dies or the chef even says everyone here is going to die. All the chefs like himself, he's very aware that he's going to die. All the customers, everyone there is going to die. Now that sets an expectation because now that he's said it, it must happen, right? It's like Chekhov's gun. If you show something in the movie or you say something, you have to follow through on that. So the whole movie, I'm like, is this going to happen? And they really play with that. They really make you think like, oh, well, they could get out. They, they bring in the Coast Guard and you think that they could be saved. Things keep happening one by one by one. And you're like, you're faked out each time. Like, oh, are they going to get saved? No. Are they going to get saved? No. But throughout all of this, none of the customer characters are actually killed. N none of them are. I believe at least that I can think of. Oh, well, okay. A couple, but for the sake of like the menu, everything essentially goes according to what the chef wants, except for the very end. And I want to talk about the ending of this movie because I loved it. And it basically pays homage to the fact that being a polite customer was the way to survive this movie. After sitting with it for a while though, I, I do have to say that Margot's ability to say like, oh, I would like a hamburger or I'm not satisfied with my meal. Can I take it to go? And he just kind of follows along with all that. It feels very deus ex machina ish. And if you're not sure what that means, I'll define it for you. Um, it's basically a part of the movie where a character is saved by like a higher being deus, uh, meaning I, th I think deus means God. And it's basically like a higher being or like an item is given to this character that they're able to use to save themselves. And it sort of feels like that. It feels a little cop-out-ish just to save the final character. They, they want someone to survive and that, you know, the whole time you're thinking, well, this, you know, Margot doesn't deserve to die here. I think it almost would have been more artistic and more bold to 
make Margot die. I don't I don't know if I necessarily fully like stand with that opinion. I think it would have been an interesting choice to have her die instead of just saving her at the very end and then having her cheeseburger as she floats away on a boat watching everyone literally blow up in flames, you know, with marshmallow hats on their head or ch chocolate on their head or whatever it is. It's just a very artistic just visual of everyone dying together. Yeah, I'm not sure how I feel about the ending. There was a part of me that loved it, but I do have to say this too. I think it feels a little inconsistent to me that the chef was so primed to have his menu like elicit perfection, but then he allowed Margot to leave. I feel like that is the aspect of it where I'm like, eh. I just want to also comment on this. I have this in my notes here. I think the like, do you have college debt scene was hilarious. I, <laughs> uh, Felicity played by Amy Carrero was I, I think done her character was done so dirty because she was brought there and they're like oh like why is she here like why does she have to die and the, the, the chef goes like do you have college debt and she's like no and he's like all right you can die and it's like it, it's just so blank it's i like everyone th there wasn't a lot of people in the theater with me but everyone laughed at that line i thought it was hilarious because everyone else in the movie is seen as jerks and when everyone dies you don't really feel bad for any of them except for her well i felt bad for felicity but yeah, I don't know. Maybe that was by design because you want to feel a little bit of remorse, but I don't know. It's It just felt like a bad customer versus bad staff, and then Margo was able to find a way to appease both sides, and that's how she got away. Um, so, for this Oscar Watch episode, a little bit of a longer one here, um, just because I'm not... Unfortunately, like this movie I don't think will win an Oscar, but... I do think that the editing of the movie was great, and I think it was very artistic for what it was. It, it took a very simple concept and it turned it into something unique, which I really appreciated and I really enjoyed. So, with that being said, uh, you know, and before we take a cut here, remember to stay tuned until the very end of the show, because I'm going to be getting into the nitty gritty of elimination games and reality TV, and maybe even give my own potential winning strategy. So, stay tuned for that. What movies would you like to see me talk about on the Oscar Watch? If you're listening on Spotify, head over to YouTube and let me know in the comments below and I will cue that movie up for a future episode. Now, let's get back to the show. I love a good movie with iconic and memorable characters. And we all know that there are all types of characters that can make up an ensemble for any movie or TV show. You have your protagonists, your antagonists, deuteragonists, supporting characters, day players, and, and the list goes on with even more subtypes of each of those character types. Then, of course, you have your, your heroes and your villains and your, I guess, people in the middle, <laughs> people sitting on the fence. And I don't just mean the superhero movies either. You, you have heroes and villains in almost every single form of whatever that you're paying attention to because obviously you have to have your protagonist is he's the person who's leading the story and then you have some sort of antagonist who is serving as the main source of conflict for the story because without a conflict your story isn't really interesting so you gotta have a conflict now the point here is that each movie has its own unique arsenal of characters each typically carrying their own purpose that maybe the audience can connect with in, on an individual basis or, you know, for the reason that I just sort of said, which is it makes the story interesting. You know, you walk away from the movie and then you say, well, like, oh, like, I really, really vibe with Ron Weasley <laughs> or something. You know what I mean? So, like, it could be anything like that. These characters exist for that purpose. Now, in this new segment that I'm calling Character Selection, I want to break down what makes different character archetypes work, and I want to do a couple of character studies on uh, prime examples of these archetypes. So this is a little bit more uh, study intensive, but also we're going to have some fun with it because we're breaking down what it means for these characters to be relevant in their respective stories, and which is something that I find really fun. And honestly, whenever I do theater, it's something I really have fun with is really getting to analyze each character and deciding like you know who they are why they have the perspective that they do it's just it's super fascinating to me so i'm i'm hoping we can have some fun breaking this down so today you know we were talking about that antagonist that's something that creates conflict rather than starting off with the protagonist we're going to look at the villain character and i'm going to specify villain here not just antagonist and i'll tell you why in a second when, when you're talking about villains right each 
story, it doesn't necessarily have a villain villain, but it each story does have an antagonist. So we'll talk about villains more specifically in a little bit, but a villain is definitely a subsection of an antagonist. An antagonist, once again, being, and I believe there's a definition here, like a an antagonist is more of just someone who creates conflict by opposing the protagonist. That's not necessarily a villain. Uh, you know, in a villain is typically evil. That's usually what a villain is. An antagonist isn't necessarily evil. So let's talk about uh, a, like the different types of quote unquote villains or I guess antagonists. Because you have like a, a villain is one of them, right? So so the traditional definition of an antagonist is usually seen as the villain or the bad guy in the story, right? Often working for evil purposes to destroy a heroic protagonist. That's sort of the villain in every story. I mean, let, let's talk about some popular villains here. You have Thanos, who is one of the bigger superhero movie uh, villains. Um, let me try to think of like, I guess if we're talking about, you know, we talk about the menu today. Chef, uh, is it Slavic? Is that the name of the character? I'm scrolling up right here. Yes, uh, Chef Slavic. That's that's the character's name from the menu. He he's a villain. He he is. I would say he's a villain, but he's got layers to him. He's got things about him that make him super interesting. So you have this villain character, and he is. It, it's an easy way to create conflict because this villain usually has some sort of goal or something that they're trying to accomplish, and that usually directly opposes whatever the protagonist of the story wants to do again not necessarily always in the form of like being evil because uh, again we'll talk about that a little bit more and that's honestly those are probably my favorite types of quote-unquote like villains or antagonists or whatever you want to say my favorite types of characters are the ones that are morally ambiguous and there are, i have plenty of examples of those but let's let's talk about another type of villain so you have a conflict creator I'm getting this from a website, by the way, but <laughs> but this is like pretty standard. Like these four are like the main types. You have the regular villain and then you have a conflict creator. Now, a villain can be a conflict creator, but conflict creators, again, don't necessarily mean that they are villains. You got to be careful with the, the semantics here. The conflict creator in I guess the best way to describe this would just be just someone with opposing ideas. And the best example of like a villain in this lens that I could provide would be a sports movie. The other teams, they're just like if you look at something like um let's, let's Moneyball. Moneyball is a baseball movie. Every I'm not gonna explain what Moneyball is about, but it's I mean at the end of the day, it's a baseball movie. Are we to say that the the baseball teams that are opposing our perspective team, like the team that we are watching the movie through the lens of are opposing teams villains are they bad no i mean they're just they're just baseball players they are against us because that's how baseball works but so so we are to root against them because they're that's how it's set up but they're not they're not evil they're just they're just doing their thing so that's that's the idea of a conflict creator there's a, something there that creates the conflict that doesn't necessarily you know spew evilness sports movies are just, that's one big example there i'm sure i could probably whip up a couple other ideas of just someone who is on the opposing side of the hero or the protagonist but isn't necessarily a bad person so that's the conflict creator let's move on to this next one is um inanimate forces now you might be like what wait in, inanimate what is what does that mean well i'll tell you one thing uh ever heard of titanic who's the villain in titanic Answer me that. <laughs> is is the is the the villain the guy that like tries to go after Leonardo DiCaprio? I mean, sure, but you could also say that he's just a conflict creator because he's not inherently a bad person. I just think that he's a little bit uh, conflicted in his own way. Like I I feel like he doesn't fully understand the context of the situation that's happening, and I'm pretty sure he ends up dying anyways. So it's like at the end of the day, he's he's basically on the same playing field as everyone else. He's not a villain. Now, granted, he's not an inanimate force. That'd be the that'd be the damn iceberg. I, the iceberg is is an example of an inanimate force, something that is a conflict creator but is not conscious while doing it. Another example of an inanimate force. If there was like a hurricane or like natural disasters or if there was a 
I, I'm very tempted to say Bruce the shark from Jaws. I don't know because it, it can't necessarily think. So there's a part of me that's like, eh, that's an inanimate force. I don't necessarily know if that qualifies. But we're probably talking something here that doesn't have a perspective or something that we can follow. Is technically a character, but it is something in the story that is something to counter the protagonist where it's it's more of man versus nature and not man versus man or uh, man versus machine or something like that. Or it's probably closer to man versus machine if there was like... What's that movie about the the car? It's like a Stephen King. Is it? It's not Carrie. That's the one with the the blood. Uh, I mean, aren't they all? But the, no, there's a car. Oh man, can't remember what the car's name is. But it's a Stephen King story. Um, that would maybe be an animate force. That that'd be an example of that. Now the protagonist themselves, man versus self. There's usually four. I think it's man versus man, man versus self. Man versus machine and man versus nature. Have I said all of them? Yeah, I think those are the four that we're looking at. Usually man versus God is one of them too, which is basically just man versus something that he can't control. So like if he was, uh, well, I, that might go against, that might be man versus self, but I'm talking specifically like a great example of this would be the movie Memento. It, it is man versus self because he is essentially working against his own memory, something that he can't necessarily control. However, that it's, it's a little bit different because in that movie, there really is no other enemy besides himself. He creates a villain for himself to follow. So it's a little bit of like a you can't trust what the protagonist is thinking situation, which, again, always really fun. We love those. We love those stories. But when we're talking about villains, those are antagonists. When we're talking about villains, there's a lot of different aspects that you know, goes into why the villain is so damn important. Because when you're watching a movie, I mean, do you really think Avengers Endgame would be as as entertaining of a movie if Thanos wasn't the villain? I mean, maybe if there was a character like him, but it, it's what makes Thanos work is his philosophies, his perspectives, his strength. There's something about him where, and again, let me, I'm going to use this as a segue into why are the villains so important for, for these types of movies specifically, but in just movies in general, they're, they're so, villains are very important because A, all right, we're, we're going through the alphabet here. A, they set the tone. They set the tone of the movie. If the villain is very uplifting, sort of like uh, Christoph Waltz's character from Inglorious Bastards, there's something about him where he's definitely a villain, but there's something sort of cheery about him. He's menacing, but he's sort of cheery in a way where it's like, okay, it's setting the tone for the movie where, yes, he's menacing, so we know that the movie is serious, but he's also a little lighthearted. He, some dark comedy thrown in there makes the movie a little bit lighter than maybe it would be because of the way that this character is creating. Now, it's that it sets the tone, but it also creates the stakes. If the if the villain of the story is this huge war de, or war, world devouring god, and that is the villain of this movie, those are pretty high stakes. Because if the if the protagonist were to lose, it the whole world is on the line. And I feel like I will say that's usually a cop out for some of these movies. Is there's a beam in the sky and, you know, if the, if the heroes don't win, the world is destroyed. And sometimes we don't need those types of stakes, but st these stakes that are being created and, you know, you can talk about this with literally any movie you see. If the conflict is directly personal to maybe the main character or a specific character, maybe the safety of, of the main character's uh, child or something like that, these stakes really make it. So it's like, okay, like, why do we care about if this hero succeeds? It's because of these stakes that are created as a result of the villain of the story, which I think is super valid. In creating stakes, it could, it could be for literally anything. That's, that's more of a villain situation. But if the story, it, you know, if the type of story that's going on, for example, is a student versus uh, their depression during fi uh, final exams, the stakes are that this student is really struggling mentally uh, having to deal with the, these final exams and I feel like that in and of itself creates stakes it you know it drives down this point of if this doesn't happen then so, then you know if a doesn't happen then B will or something like that now also see it, it also 
provides a unique perspective because when we're watching a story, we're seeing through the hero's lens. Sometimes it's fun to see what's going on from the opposition, to watch the hero from the eyes of someone else who is in direct uh, opposition to the hero. I think that's fun, it's especially when, tech, when sometimes that perspective is... I mean, sometimes it's evil, but sometimes it's just an opposing perspective. So being, imagine if we were to see a baseball movie, or and I think there are pr probably plenty of animes that do this, but if we're watching some sort of sports movie, where not only are we getting the perspective of the main character, but we're getting the perspective from maybe someone else on the team, or someone from on the other team, and now all of a sudden we really care about everyone involved, and it just becomes so much more entertaining. So that's why the villain is so important, but what makes a good villain character? Well, we'll end with this. What makes a good villain character? I think there's this scale that I like to personally follow. And it's it's really a range of measuring their physical strength, depending on what the situation is. If it's a superhero movie and they're really, really strong, just like, like they have really good superpowers. That can be really intimidating, and that could sometimes make a good villain, but that's not the only thing. Because if they're really strong and that's all there is to them, then, uh, well, that can be kind of boring. It can be, if they have no personality. If they have their own stakes, they have their own backstory, their own emotion, their own emotional perspective and point of view, that now creates... A, a different layer to this character that makes them even more entertaining and enjoyable to watch. So I'm going to just rattle off a bunch of villains that I think are really good villains. You know, I'll, I'll name Darth Vader here. I'll name Voldemort. I'll name, I already named uh, Christoph Waltz's character from Inglorious Bastards. I don't remember the character's name. Um, uh, let's see another, I'm thinking Mark Zuckerberg from the social network, just to list in a non superhero movie, something really good. I mean, he's definitely an anti, he's sort of an anti-hero, uh, sort of, I don't know. I don't know if I have that exactly right. <laughs> I also maybe saying that he is the villain would get this uh, video taken down, but I digress. These characters, they range. Some Sometimes they're really, sometimes they're sane. Sometimes they're insane sometimes, you know? it's Sometimes they're really smart. Sometimes they're really dumb. Sometimes they're really strong or weak. Sometimes they have some really emotional baggage that they're carrying that's driving all of their decisions. Sometimes they have their own stakes, their own conflicts that they need to overcome. And the, their way of trying to overcome the conflict is the protagonist. So sometimes the protagonist unknowingly is the conflict of someone else's story, which I think in and of itself is super interesting. So that is basically the importance of a villain in movies. And normally this second slot here, I like to try to have a little bit of goofy banter um, for, for segment number two, just to, you know, to get a different tone in the, in the podcast. But I think it's so important to understand the different types of characters in these movies because it helps us value them a little bit more. And instead of just watching a villain, you're trying to understand them. And I think that that's part of the enjoyment of watching a movie sometimes. But now that we've discussed the villain character in entertainment, what other character archetypes would you like to hear me explain? Are there any? Maybe I'll do the heroes next. Maybe you want me to talk about the comedic character like Korg or <laughs> from from uh, the Thor movies you let me know in the comments below and I will see you after the break if you are enjoying the show so far remember to check out the cinema spotlight Spotify playlist and subscribe to keep up with future episodes now let's get back to the show okay we are back for segment three of episode three and Okay, before I really get into this segment, I, I just want to let everyone know a little behind the scenes. I had already filmed this segment. This is my this is a, a re-recording of this segment, and here's why. This was originally a lot more educational on what it like reality TV is and the different types, and specifically what are elimination games in reality TV, which. It's fine. That could be interesting. But here's the thing. I want to provide all of you with the best content that I can put forward. And I feel like segment three has consistently been very creative, very miscellaneous. 
and, and very improvised. I, I like the idea that I can throw out some improv improvisation <laughs> um, into these episodes. Now, I've had a little bit of caffeine, so I'm in the spirits, and we're going to change it up a little bit. So, I still want to talk a little bit about reality TV and shows like Survivor and Big Brother and the elimination game aspect of reality TV, but I want to, today, spend some time going over my strategy in Big Brother if I were to ever play. And I, I whittled it down between Big Brother and Survivor because those are the two I know the most. I feel like I could go either way with it, and I think that the strategy would be similar overall, but it would be a little different. That being said, I do want to talk a little bit about reality TV and these elimination games and what makes them tick. Like, what what's the point of them? Why do people like them? Now, here's the thing. Why am I doing, why am I covering reality TV? Well, I, I say in my intro how I talk about movies, TV, and everything in between. Reality TV, last time, last time I checked, is in between. <laughs> it, it is one of those things that is in between. So, that being said, let's just jump right into it. So, we're talking about Survivor, we're talking about Big Brother. Those are going to be the two I'm focusing on today. I got to watch myself because I feel like the caffeine is really just like cranking the treadmill up to like 10 miles per hour, which doesn't sound very fast, but for me, that would be very fast. <laughs> but what is an elimination game? If you're watching and you haven't even heard of these shows, what's the concept of these games? Well, you're going through, and I just want to throw out a couple more examples. The Amazing Race, uh, The Challenge is another one. The Circle, I believe, is another one on Netflix. I think a, a show like... Um, RuPaul's Drag Race would fit under this. Uh, these are uh, some more examples of elimination games, and that's what I'm choosing to call it, but I think that they all, I think that's a fair assessment. Basically, you start out with however many people. They're doing challenges and they're, they have tasks that they need to get done per episode, I suppose. And by the end of an episode, one of the contestants are eliminated until eventually there is one person left standing. Or, I guess in the case of Amazing Race, and probably some other ones that exist where this is allowed, uh, two people at the end, because they're working as a team. So, why do people like shows like this? And and how, how did it begin? I mean, they were social experiments. They wanted to see how far people would go if a huge money prize was on the line. Would you become manipulative? Would you turn into a villainized version of yourself? This is what these people wanted to really tap into and see, oh, well, would this make good TV? Yes. <laughs> yes, it, it does. Make, in my opinion, it, it does. I, I mean, when they water it down, it doesn't as much, but it, it's giving people an incentive to push their adrenaline and to push their competitiveness into a stake. It, it really creates a lot of drama, um, really interesting strategic gameplay, and it really just creates a whole culture around it where people are watching from the sidelines, critiquing their games and how the, like, you know, did they make a mistake here? Did they do that? The fact that it creates a whole culture. I mean, there are things like edgic rankings and there are big brother drafts where you draft the players and you get points based on like if they want to challenge or the, the more they survive or stuff like that. These are um, all things that make the reality TV Th th these types of shows it makes them really famous in, in comparison to things like dance moms or treehouse masters although dance moms is pretty popular but that's besides the point now why do i like these shows because this is a personal thing for me i know that there are plenty of like diehard fans of survivor and, and stuff but here's the thing what makes me interested oh i love the chaos i mean let's be honest here i i watch these shows and i want to watch for someone who almost doesn't even give one <laughs> if, you, if you catch my drift and just kind of does whatever because it's entertaining but also like it's it's a good move and I feel like that's how I would play so let's dive into what my strategy would be if I was cast onto the real life show now it's time to get meta because my strategy would be to want to return Re realistically right I mean you get exposure when you're on the show. So my idea is I want to win, of course. But there are some people who are like, I don't really care about being entertaining. I want to be on the show and I'm going to just do whatever it takes to win, whether it be boring or whatever. Some people have that mentality. And I appreciate that. But 
I'm, it's, it's just not me. I would not go on that show and take the boring route. I would always, because I'm an entertainer at heart. I, I don't feel like it's in my nature to just do the easy move. I feel like I would overthink things and I would try my best to be a performer. And that's that's why I have this podcast. I, I really enjoy just kind of putting myself out there, putting my, my thoughts and opinions out there for, for people to either love or hate and that that's sort of the name of the game in, in this sort of nature. So if we're talking Big Brother or Survivor, here's my initial strategy right out the gate. I want to be quiet, but not too quiet. Here's why. If you talk too much, you get in too many people's ears too early. People are going to see you as a threat. They're going to see you as someone who is trying to dictate the pace of the game. And therefore, you will be an early target, especially in Survivor. If you are not pulling your weight in challenges and you have that sort of that social game where you're talking to people and all they get is this vibe of, well, all they want to do is use me to advance and that they don't want to create an actual bond with me. Axed. I mean, they're just not going to survive or I wouldn't survive in that instance. So I'd be quiet. I would be observant. What my goal is in these first couple weeks, and I guess we can shift gears to Big Brother here. I don't want to rock the boat, but I want to develop enough one-on-one -on -one relationships with different enough people. And when I say that, I mean like if there's if there's a dude that I really am vibing with and I feel like, oh, that could be a, that could be a good strong relationship down the line. Okay, cool. There's one. Now I'm going to I'm going to move over if if say um that was, you know, a younger a younger gentleman, I want to maybe shift gears to um, you know, someone else that, that just wouldn't fit the same archetype. And, and the reason why I'm doing this is because I want to be in all types of conversations going around the house, because let's just look at how big brother typically operates, right? At the very, very, very early stages of the game, you have nothing really to base yourself off of. All, all you have is maybe if you have a personality that draws people in. So for example, if I'm looking and I see someone who's very, very talkative, that person could be a target, but almost never would they be a target right off the bat. I want to get on their good side. I'm going to go over to that, that chatty Kathy, talk to that person, get on their good side. So therefore, if, if that person ends up dictating how the, the first week is going to go, I'm never going to be on the radar because that person has me covered. I want to make sure that in the for, first couple weeks, I'm never the target. I want people to come to me because they feel comfortable. That would be my strategy going into the game. Now, is that manipulative? Of course. <laughs> of course that is. But here's the thing. I'm not here to tell you, oh, well, I'm going into this game and I want to be a saint. No. Where, who, who gets anywhere in these devious games from, from being like the honorable good guy? I mean, I would love to be able to have that role, except that I just don't feel like when I'm playing a game. I like to cause chaos, like I've, I've mentioned. For example, whenever I play Mafia with friends or Werewolf or uh, Town of Salem, however you choose to title that type of game, my goal is never to be like, okay, I am innocent and here's why. My goal is, you don't know if I'm innocent, but we should work together anyways. We should, we should just embrace the fact that you don't know it, whether or not you can trust me, but I want you to feel comfortable because we're both acknowledging that head on. And that's the sort of um, strategy that I, even, even if I am innocent, and even if I suspect someone may not be innocent, I will talk to them anyways. I will try to make a deal with anyone because if it means I get to last a little bit longer in the game, then that's the whole point, right? Especially in Big Brother, where your goal is to last the longest. It's not necessarily who played the best game of the season. And, and you know, if you're listening to me and you're saying, well, what does that mean? To, to have the best game of the season? What is that? Well, uh, you know, I would say that in that context, ha playing the best game is the person who is constantly like winning challenges. Boom, I'm in charge. I get to pick people that are going on the block in the case of, you know, Big Brother. These two people are up for elimination. This is all my doing. I'm going to convince everyone to do what I want. Those are the types of people typically who are seen as the biggest threats. And how does Big Brother work? You take out the biggest threats. So being the best player of the season is not actually what you want to do. Maybe if you want to go in with the mentality of, I want to be the best that there ever was, which is unrealistic, to be honest with you. I, I would never go into that show saying, I'm going to be so amazing. I would go into the show saying, God, please do not let me, <laughs> do not let me freaking be the first one eliminated. That would be my immediate goal. 
And this is the best way to do that is to never play the best game. Always manage your threat levels. Have a couple people ahead of you. That's what I would do. I would make people feel comfortable with me. Give people no real reason to target me. I want to play the middle, which can sometimes be seen as boring, but not if you flip flop. A prime example of this, if you are a Survivor fan, is uh, Tony Vlachos. Tony Vlachos, generally regarded as the best Survivor player of all time, not necessarily by everyone, but I would consider him the best who ever played. He's one of two two-time winners, and I genuinely believe he deserved, hands down, both of his wins. I'm not going to get into that argument, but Tony did this thing where he would flip-flop between sides, and they couldn't really target him because of the fact that he used his social game to his advantage and he made it so that like they couldn't really get him out because it never benefited anyone to get them out there were three people on one side three people on the other tony would be in the middle so the three people on one side couldn't be like oh well let's target tony he's the best player no 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 they needed tony because without tony they wouldn't even have a chance of surviving the vote so th they have to look short term so that's the type of way that i would choose to play a game like this i would sit myself in the middle i want to be the one that people feel comfortable going to and talking to and all that I want to be in everyone's ear while also l doing a lot of listening and making my own decisions. I want to cause chaos. If there's a clear cut, oh, let's vote this person off because they're the biggest threat. Eh, maybe that's my opportunity to, you know, wiggle my fingers and, uh, what well, actually, no, that's not what I meant to say. <laughs> it's, it's almost like shake my, like do some jazz hands and say, you know what? What if I work with that person that everyone's trying to get out now, all of a sudden this person is like, okay, I, ha I have an ally in James. I got an ally in him, and it's going to be a magical time. And that's that's the sort of vibe. Now, do I think I could genuinely win a Big Brother season? Well, um, or, or Survivor, I don't know. And here's the thing. I feel like, yes, I could, except I think there's some things going against me. Um, I think the fact that I'm ye on the younger side, I've seen, you know, in plenty of situations where... A younger player who actually played a pretty decent game was not awarded the win because people don't take them seriously because they are younger um, or because at the end of the day, the jury who is voting, you have to make sure that the jury like you're voting people out, but not burning people on the way out the door. If they don't respect you or if they don't think you're, you are deserving of the money, then they're not going to vote you to win, even if you may have played the best game out of the people there at the end, which is a whole nother aspect. But that being said, if anyone who's casting for Big Brother is interested <laughs> i would more than like or more than uh i'd be more than grateful to be on the show and i would i would do my best to put on a show i guess this is my um audition of sorts so if you're following along with me let's get me on big brother let's get me on uh, i don't know how i would do on survivor i would do it but i i feel like that one is like you eat bugs and stuff and i don't not that i wouldn't eat a bug for a million dollars but i would definitely think about it a lot beforehand um but yeah no that's, uh, that, that's essentially my strategy for big brother and this is why i love these types of games because it, it creates so many different like what if scenarios that i think are super fun but let me ask you this if you played big brother or if you played survivor what would your strategy be how would it differ from mine do you have any other thoughts about these types of elimination games please let me know in the comments below I want to thank everyone for listening to the Cinema Spotlight. If you enjoyed, please leave a like on the video and give the show a rating on Spotify. And please take a moment to subscribe to the show. Uh, I would really appreciate that. Follow me on Instagram at senajames 35 for updates on when new episodes get released. That's senajames 35 Now, there has been a little bit of a hiatus with episodes. Uh, I, I do acknowledge that. And that kind of came as a result of you know, uh, holidays and procrastination and getting a little bit of sick and my voice definitely suffering from the sniffles. Uh, but we should be back on track with the Golden Globes right around the corner and the Oscars coming in March. There's plenty of content that you should be expecting from this show. And um, it's, you know, it's a, it's a great time to be a movie fan and uh, to get super excited. So if you want to let me know what movies to check out and which ones to, to single out, head on over to YouTube and drop a comment or two. That's all I got for you. Stay classy, friends.